Hello from Honduras, from the Sam Conover family. Maria, my wife, Joy, our oldest. Aida and I, first of all, praise God for his grace for this gospel ministry. We are grateful to work together in church planting as your partners. We serve with our Baptist Mid-Missions team, Ruth Coleman and the Howells in San Pedro Sula, the second largest city in Honduras with over one million inhabitants. Honduras is 80% mountains and is bordered by the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Honduran people are religious and have a form of godliness, but deny the power of God to save and transform their lives by His grace. We are focused on establishing churches. New Testament churches are evangelism and discipleship centers where entire families can be saved, be baptized, and discipled to live to the praise of God's glory. We are supporting the national leaders in the third church plant from the Mother Church. We mentor the leaders and their wives one-on-one. -on -one. We organize modular courses to develop national pastors and their leadership teams. The Baptist Mid-Missions Pastoral Enrichment Program is providing teachers for these courses. Eight churches and up to 50 participants are involved annually. Years ago, God burdened me to start a small library in the Mother Church to enhance our training of our leaders uh, and leaders from other churches. Uh, we donated our bookshelves and many of our books and later more books and some school materials were added. Uh, God burdened some of you too to donate theological books and discipleship materials, uh, Christian growth books, and uh, we are eternally grateful for you. God's grace flowing through you to us is so encouraging. Thank you for being part of our team here in Honduras. Me llamo Neto y soy pastor de la iglesia. Yo uso estos libros todas las semanas. Gracias por mostrarnos la gracia de Dios en su generosidad, regalándonos tantos libros. Me llamo Edu y soy diácono de la iglesia. Cada semana yo uso los libros de, de la biblioteca pastoral que fueron donados. Su ejemplo de la gracia de dar me anima mucho. Gracias por su generosidad. Soy John Mitchell. My family and I have been missionaries with Baptist Mid Missions for 36 years. 27 of those years we were in church planning ministry in the country of Brazil. The last few years, the Lord has allowed us a more global ministry, referred to as the Pastoral Enrichment Program, in which we travel globally and are involved in a teaching and preaching ministry to pastors and church leaders and uh, church institutes and Bible institutes in various countries. It's been a joy to serve over the last four years with the Conovers here in Honduras, involved in also training uh, church leaders. Our downtown work involves mostly lower-income families, single mothers, and many neglected children. We provide food and medical emergency help. We give group English classes, weekly public school Bible story ministries, children and teen clubs, and distribution of bilingual New Testaments in public schools.
Our new work is in Aurora, a needy urban neighborhood next door to a notorious barrio with gangs and drugs. God brought us to this area through our girl's violin teacher, who lives in Aurora. Through many visits to the public schools, God opened the school principal's heart to invite us to parent-teacher meetings to teach on parenting. Then she opened the doors of the school on Sundays to host our Bible study at no charge. In this same neighborhood is Women of Hope, a ministry to prostitutes and their children. The leaders are excited about our new work right across the street from their ministry house. God answered prayers for the sale of our small farm property that we had considered using for camp. We have now located an area in the mountains halfway between the country's two major cities. Pray for negotiations for this property and for the funds to develop it. Youth and family camping is a powerful tool for evangelism and discipleship. Thank you to our individual and local church partners for your generosity. Your prayers, letters, visits, and financial support are special tokens of God's love to us. We love you and pray for you often. Anywhere you go, there's people in need of the Lord. So let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing, Rescue the Perishing. First and last verse of Rescue the Perishing. Let's stand to our feet and sing. Rescue the Perishing, care for the dying. Snap them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen. many times before, but pay attention to the words of the song. Facing a task unfinished, we go to all the world. Thank you. 
gospel anthem. Speaks of our need to share the gospel uh, now and to take on the interests of others and, and love others uh, in gratitude for our great salvation. Listen to the word. <laughs> Because today, now 
<clears throat> We're going to share an update uh, this morning, various things, but I uh, want uh, Maria to uh, give you an idea of what her ministry life is like there in Honduras. So uh, her first language is Spanish, and she was born and raised in Honduras. So she's going to speak in English, I believe, again. That's the first <laughs> service. I can translate. Let me know. You can do a little both, actually. Whatever, whatever you like. But uh, are you ready for which one? Whatever. Well, I uh, work in the ministry in, down in Honduras with uh, the uh, ladies' uh, meetings every uh, twice a week in, uh, in a month, uh, every month. And I um, work in the Sunday school with the kids from four to 11 years old. And uh, it's a uh, um, nice uh, time with the kids, uh, learning with them and teaching. It's nice, it's a blessing. Um, I help uh, with uh, Saturdays in ESL, uh, English class. Um, making the um, food with them, with the kids too, helping them, you know, uh, snacks. And um, I do to um, in the public schools twice a week, every every uh, month, with uh, Sam and, uh, and helping the kids too uh, to read because some kids have problems to read, and so we use the Bible and teaching them the Bible too. So that's most the work I do in helping in the in the house too with the girls, helping with the Spanish class and that kind of things. So that's my work. Thank you. Before you, before you go down, could you just tell them how much family you have there? Um, you know, your, your mother is still living? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, you just tell them a little bit about that so they get a feel for your family that's there. Yeah, we, we are six. I'm number five. Uh, we are six. Uh, number five, we have uh, three boys and three girls. Uh, all my family is uh, believers. That uh, we, I came from a Catholic uh, family, so um, my mom and dad uh, get got saved when they are 50 years old, so very old. But they help us, you know, to know that we are sinners and help them help us to realize that we need to get saved. So anyway, that's my. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we are grateful to be back. Uh, it's been at least, I guess, around five years since we've been here. It's kind of lost track. We try to get back and report to our churches at least once every four years. So we appreciate so much your faithfulness of so many years now. I know at least 10 years uh, partnering with us in ministry in Honduras. So uh, thank you so much. Maria and I have been married 20 years, and we've been serving in Honduras for 20 years. So uh, we met in March of 99, and uh, married in June of 2000. Uh, honeymooned in the States primarily, and moved all my belongings down to Honduras. So since July of 2000, we've been uh, serving there in Honduras. We went as tent maker missionaries, uh, supporting ourselves, uh, serving part time in the uh, church planting. Ministries there, uh, so it's it's been quite an adventure. We, uh, you know, Maria was already bilingual when we met, and uh, I I uh, had learned the language, the culture, so I wanted to go and just uh, live there and uh, support ourselves. So that's the way we did it for the first uh, four years. We were uh, working uh, part time, full time. I taught it, I taught in a Christian school, all English, and Maria supervised and managed a small business there uh, with her family. And so then after about uh, three years, we were able to go full-time uh, there with the support we were receiving, we began to receive stateside. And, uh, even the church there in Honduras supported us as a part-time pastor there. I was ordained there into the ministry. And so uh, we're excited, we're praising the Lord for his faithfulness for 20 years of uh, marriage and ministry. So uh, our primary focus is church planting and then leadership training. We're also involved with camp programs at least once a year, family camps, youth camps. Uh, we're uh, hoping to buy a camp property and develop our own camp uh, uh, 
project. Uh, uh, so we're looking, been looking for quite a while for properties uh, there. So pray we can find the right property in God's time and way. Uh, we also are involved with uh, English as a second language uh, training, teaching on Saturdays, we're able to get uh, a lot of attention from the people that do not go to the church, just passers by that want to learn English. And so it's a good outreach tool. So we do that on Saturday afternoons. And I'm involved in leadership with the field team uh, with our mission there. We have five uh, full-time uh, Baptist men missionaries in uh, our city. We have a single lady, an assistant, now been with us three years. Praise the Lord for Ruth and her uh, great help there with the children's and, and English ministry and the ladies' ministries. Team, even with the teens, uh, she uh, heads up a junior high uh, Sunday school class and uh, helps plan and prepare for it. Youth activities, and games, and things are great, great help. Musically talented as well. She plays piano and flute and the guitar and uh, what else? Several, several instruments. Uh, Ruth Cole, so praise the Lord for her. And uh, so we, uh, as you saw, pretty busy with ministry before the COVID-19, the pandemic. So we've been challenged. Uh, this pandemic has been like a giant reset button in all areas of our lives and, and ministry. We uh, had a couple trips canceled. We were having, wanted to have two teams come down to Honduras this year. Those have both been canceled. We had a trip planned to go to the, island, the major island of Roatan for a missionary retreat uh, in May, I believe, and that was canceled. Uh, just everything shut down now. So big, big reset uh, for our, our lives and ministry there. Of course, all the services and all the Bible studies and uh, meetings, uh, discipleship, had to go all online, virtual. Um, and we had our future plans for a live stream uh, video seminary was put on pause. Hopefully that will be able to start up in 2021. A lot of, a lot of preparation needed for that. Uh, all of a sudden, our ministries no, no longer can receive offerings. We have no meetings in person. So a lot of, a lot of challenges just you know, in that area. So we've had to ask people to, to direct deposit their offerings in the church account in the bank. Uh, I've been, in recent days, I've heard that they've been able to, the churches have been able to uh, offer online giving. And so we're, we're uh, uh, updating as, as the pandemic continues and continues and can, continues uh, to shut everything down. It's been amazing uh, the longevity of this. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we, we reopened, they reopened the economy 20% uh, about three weeks ago, and then they shut it down again, and now they're reopening again tomorrow. And actually, the public transportation is going to start up tomorrow on a limited basis. I don't know how you're going to space out, keep people a social distance on the buses and taxis and all. That'll be interesting. And so that's in the works for tomorrow. Um, we have about 40,000 confirmed cases of the virus, about uh, I think around 1,200, 1,400 uh, confirmed deaths, uh, about 5,000 recoveries. Uh, the trend in the, in the testing for the virus is going down, thank the Lord. About, uh, I think, 500 uh, confirmed new cases daily. It used to be about over, over 1,000 confirmed cases daily from the testing. So things are improving, it seems, in that way. So, uh, But the, the, the hospital system is, is weak. Uh, there are private hospitals with quality care, uh, comparatively, but the state hospital, government-funded hospital system is very uh, weak, and so they're trying not to overrun the hospitals with, with the virus cases. So uh, many doctors and nurses have come down with the virus and so we lose healthcare workers uh, as well. So it's, it's a very challenging time uh, with everything shut down as, as it has been since middle of March. Uh, so uh, our girls had to uh, have come home from school and of course all classes offered on Zoom and uh, internet uh, in the house and, and so that's been a challenging time. Uh, being everyone at home together and uh, trying to find a room for Joy and a room for Aida to take their class, you know, different different grades. And, uh, so uh, I lost my office to Joy and part, part of the time, lost my, uh, my iPad, my laptop, and uh, different things where we're having to share. And, uh, she, and of course, the internet's weaker now because there's so many electronic devices going at the same time, uh, in and out of classes, and just a really uh, different situation. Just having school at home. Uh, so, of course, our time uh, helping them get through their classes at home, we all, all of a sudden became tutors and, and uh, you know, 
missed a lot of different adjustments just driving school at home, so challenging. Um, as far as our, uh, you know, we had unexpected expenses through all, all of that as well. Um, uh, we had, you know, difficulty reaching some of our people in the churches because they don't have access to internet, uh, don't have the electronic means to, to hook up to the services. We, uh, we went immediately on the Facebook Live for our Sunday morning services, uh, all done with, uh, you know, iPhones recording at, at our house, sitting on the sofa, uh, live stream on Sunday mornings. And uh, then we started uh, videotaping uh, through YouTube the, the messages uh, in my office apart and putting those up on YouTube and just doing live uh, worship and, and uh, prayer time together on Facebook. And uh, then on Wednesday nights, with the help of some other leaders in the church, doing the Zoom prayer meetings, coming together for prayer through Zoom, that, that's been a big, big encouraging time to actually just to see people and interact uh, through that, that method. So a lot of good uh, resources, uh, you know, electronic resources, but uh, again, not, not much face-to-face. -face. Uh, our, our country is considered 100% stringency lockdown. Uh, that, you know, that's much higher than the United States. Uh, we cannot get out and drive our cars on the weekends at all. During the week, we can only drive around when our number coordinates with the day. So once every 10 days, my number on my ID uh, I'm allowed to get out and do my errands, whether it be supermarket, banking, uh, all essential business, uh, pharmacy. Uh, so on those days that we get to go out and buy groceries at a major supermarket, we take food down to some of our people in the, in the neighborhood, uh, the downtown work, and uh, even some others. And so we have, have had some face-to-face -face interaction, uh, always wearing a mask and keeping our distance. So uh, that's basically what ministry looks like while we're uh, on lockdown. We've had some youth activities on Zoom as well, uh, playing games on Zoom with the teenagers. Uh, that's been inter interesting. Some uh, discipleship courses uh, being taught in Zoom, Zoom, through Zoom as well in, in houses. Uh, so our leaders are making the adjustment. Our, uh, our the pastor, the, the lead pastor, uh, the Honduran full-time, he's been supported by the churches. Uh, he is going down to the downtown church and recording his message uh, really without permission. Uh, he does that and goes and sneaks into the downtown church as one of his children records him uh, for 20 minutes and then he gets, goes back home. So uh, it's, uh, it's been, been challenging. But things are looking better. Uh, we were just in a, a Zoom leadership meeting uh, Friday night and uh, we're got a, now we've got a strategy of how we can now get a, a salva conducto permission for pastors and, and missionary workers to go around, drive around, and put a, put a, a sign on the side of your car, a magnetic sign, uh, have a uh, identity card with your position, what you do, and a description of what your ministry is and what you're doing out on the road. So uh, with, with that, we'll be able to move around a little better, a little more. And so uh, the lady, mission, missionary ladies and, and pastors and uh, even some of our other leaders will be able to move around for ministry uh, starting up in about a week, so that's that's an improvement. So we're looking forward to that, see how that goes. Um, some of the uh, encouraging things, things we're rejoicing about what God is doing through all this, uh, we've had a slower pace, been able to spend more time with the Lord and just prepare our hearts and be together more as a family. Uh, we are seeing that people are joining in online, watching us online, people that have never come to services in person, uh, feel more comfortable joining us for services on the internet or watching a, a YouTube uh, message video. Uh, even some visitors have joined into the Zoom prayer meeting. So that's been, that's been exciting. Um, we're rejoicing that uh, you know, people are reaching out to us, they're telling us that they're seeing us on these virtual uh, means of ministry. And we had a, a mother uh, call one of our leaders about, uh, about two months ago and uh, she said that her son and his wife, who's been married about two years, were struggling and it looked like they were going to separate and divorce and, and she asked for help. And so the leader called me and asked me to contact them and we set up an appointment on a WhatsApp video call. And I called them and we talked for about an hour and a half. And so the first hour we talked about the gospel and we led them to Christ on WhatsApp video call. So David and his wife Marjorie were saved and then we started counseling them that very first uh, video call 
and then uh, follow up uh, every Sunday uh, evening. Uh, we started discipling them uh, through WhatsApp and through Zoom uh, calls. So uh, they're still meeting with me on Zoom calls, even here stateside. I'm in, in touch with them. So we're rejoicing that you know God's power to save is not limited to face-to-face -face, uh, communication. God can use uh, even a, a video call to uh, spread the gospel. Uh, so pray for the Perdomos, if you think about them. Their growth. Uh, David came down with the virus as well. He had, had to be isolated there in his house uh, from his wife. So they were separated by the virus, but not uh, through marital difficulties. They're, they're learning how to get along and praise the Lord for their uh, for God working even in their marriage. And uh, the mother-in-law lives in the house now. She's come down with the virus, and so she's there and help, trying to help her. David has recovered, so uh, pray for Marjorie's mother to recover and, and uh, for her uh, salvation as well. Uh, we have had more time to visit with our neighbors because we've been on lockdown in the house and so where we live we uh, have various neighbors that need to be saved for, uh, pray for Reuben and his family uh, Israel and Raphael and uh, Theodore some various uh, neighbors close by that we're trying to reach out to uh, we had a deacon a deacon candidate a faithful leader in downtown work was preparing for ordination to become a deacon he had to stop uh, his meetings with me working towards his ordination and so that was put on hold it's hard to ordain a deacon when you can't you know, have to social distance can't lay hands on somebody uh, during the, the separation of the virus so pray for tulio that he will be uh, encouraged and continue uh, faithful and prepared to be ordained uh, as soon as possible uh, our seminary live stream seminary has been put on hold until 2021 pray for wisdom in, in that area as well as uh, searching for a property for our, for our camp so we have savings, about $26,000 for a camp property uh, and, and funds for that. But uh, we need to raise more and so pray for wisdom about choosing the right property in God's time uh, in the coming months. Uh, any questions about what is going on there in Honduras? Uh, specific things that maybe I haven't mentioned. Uh, we are. Uh, maintaining our support. We haven't lost any support through the uh, pandemic. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, we're at about 92% on our support. So, any questions? Yes. How many churches do you have? Okay, so I'm overseeing three works. The original Mother Church has had uh, five, well, excuse me, four, has had four um, daughter churches total. And that's since 1994, when the Mother Church was begun, uh, we've had uh, four, we're in, into the fourth uh, daughter church out of that, out of that work. So, I, so there's, a, um, uh, there's a, a missionary pastor over the, the first work out of, out, of, out of that, excuse me, yeah, out of the first work out of that. There's a national pastor over the second church, and then there's a national pastor over the third, who you saw in the video. And we have an ordained deacon over the downtown work, and, and then I'm, my wife and I go on Sunday afternoons and we have a, a Bible study in a public school where we're starting to really the, be the fourth work out of that, out of the middle church. So that's the progression. other questions our daughters are 17 and 13 and joy is a senior in high school rising senior and i need an eighth rising eighth grader and they're involved great help in the ministry praise the lord for them yes sir are you by our when when you plan to get the back down august the 11th is our return date to Honduras. So, yeah, coming up soon how many people do you have in your services in the mother church, presently we have around 70. The daughter church, anywhere from around 30-ish, 25, 30 on average. And then the, uh, the downtown, the new work, uh, just a handful of, of folks there. We have one new believer there, uh, Santos Ramos. And we're still in touch on the Messenger Facebook. And, uh, so trying to encourage him that the new the newest work the bible study in the public school is only about eight months old and we've 
only been face to face there about four months. So it's uh, interesting. But we've been able to go, go by there and take food to some a very poor family there uh, in, that, in that area. So we've seen these people. Yes. What is your political climate down there? We have a very positive pro American president now. Uh, we've had some leftist, a lot of leftist influence in prior to 2010. Uh, but generally, Honduras is very pro American. Uh, it's the has the largest uh, military base in all of Central America with American forces there. It's the number one ally, really, of the United States in Central America. So good in that way. A very Americanized country in a lot of ways. Still developed, a de developing country. Uh, but uh, it's a, we have much of the, many of the restaurants you have here, uh, we have there. Uh, so it's an uh, interesting field. Do you? As a follow-up, do you can you address the matter of the, the schooling? We see your daughter is a senior. Yes. Okay. Uh, here in the United States, our country is being ruined by the public education system. What they're teaching is it the same there? There is a, a, some influence, uh, liberal, uh, humanistic influence in the public schools. Um, but not at, not as much in, in a lot of ways. I mean, uh, the LGBTQ whatever influence that is so prevalent here is not prevalent there. Abortion is illegal in Honduras, for example. It's, it's just you know because of the Catholic conservative foundation of, of that country, you know, it's illegal abortion and, and homosexuality is not prevalent. There is some. Uh, there's I believe there's one Islamic church in our city, so there's not a strong Islamic presence in Honduras. So a lot of positives in that way. We have total freedom of religion. We can get to public schools, hand out bilingual New Testaments, wide open door. We can give give out anything with the gospel, literature. You know, most any time I can get into the public schools. So that's uh, wide open doors. Praise the Lord for that. Do you have a fellowship with other evangelical groups like, like Camino Global or other other groups in your city? And will they have participation in your camps? Will you also get them established? We have a wide variety of uh, Baptist churches that are getting together with us for camp the camps uh, that we go to about two hours out of the city. Um, we, as you saw in the video, we help out with this, this one ministry. It's an evangelical ministry to uh, ladies and their children in the downtown, the prostitute. That's an evangelical ministry that we're able to help out. So there's some, some uh, working together uh, on a limited basis. Um, we, we have a couple international churches, all English speaking uh, in the city, you know, that, that, that are, exist we, we, with our Spanish focus, we, we can't get involved with uh, a lot of various missionary groups that are there. So you know, it's, it's kind of a, a mix of a, so. yeah. Isn't it one of the highest drug centers in, in Central America? Honduras has a lot of influence of narco traffic, drug traffic coming through uh, from South America. So yeah, we have gang related crime, uh, a good bit of that. In fact, our city was number one in the world in violent crime about six years ago. Uh, so yeah, it, there's, there's dangerous areas. You know, just try to be wise. And, you know, always when we're out in public, watch your, watch your back. And don't go into certain really hot zones. But as I mentioned in the video, our new work is right on the outskirts of a very uh, dangerous neighborhoods. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, you know, gang members that threaten school public school teachers, and um, it's, yeah, it's it's real, very violent society. 
Anything else? How many of you, have any of you seen our live presentations on Facebook or even YouTube? Anybody seen us? We've had a lot of people, friends on Facebook, and just people really all over the world have responded and said, hey, we see you on Facebook, we see you on YouTube. Uh, so uh, the, the positive side of all this, even though local ministry has been greatly restricted, our interna international uh, exposure has been increased. It's, it's really neat how God has opened up the world. The world has become smaller. I'm able to get online for pastor prayer huddles and, and be encouraged uh, with pastors from all over, again, all over the world. Uh, every Friday morning, I, I have opportunity to do that. Uh, more time available to meet with family and have prayer meetings on, on Zoom, prayer meetings with family, both in Honduras and, and uh, stateside. And of course, my wife's family, we have Monday night prayer meetings once a month on, through Zoom. We used to get together, we can't even get together with family and have a prayer meeting. Uh, so it's uh, still, still on lockdown. And of course, the economy is suffering quite a bit. A lot of businesses shut down. Uh, the retail businesses cannot open. In, in our city now, in the rural areas, things are reopening much more. Uh, where there's not as many cases of the virus. So it's a mixed bag. But our city is over a million people and the capital is over two million people. And so we're in the hot zone of the virus. So much, much more limited. Let's pray that we'll cope, and not just cope, but thrive and, and, and reach out uh, through the means that we have. Uh, that's the challenging thing. When you can't get out face to face and you, you know, you, it's easy to get complacent because you, you're restricted so much. But we, we really have to take advantage of the open doors we have. So I pray, pray for that area. Right, well, let's look at God's Word briefly. I want to share from Romans chapter 15, verse 15. I won't have time to preach an entire message, but this message, this passage basically could be summed up in this grace for global ministry. Grace for global ministry. Romans 15, 15. And Paul speaks of the grace of God is to be the is, is what is responsible, credited for his ministry. Grace for global ministry. Remember, Paul was a Jew, but sent to the Gentiles out to the pagan world, global, he had a global missionary ministry. And it was only by God's grace. We just sang about uh, Jesus. Your saving grace and truth rescued me. And we uh, would echo Paul's uh, tribute to God's grace uh, that it's only by his grace. Were it not for his grace, where would we be? Where would you be were it not for God's grace and love, loving favor to you, un undeserved? Uh, everything, beginning at salvation, is only by God's grace. Um, I love this tribute to God's grace, uh, a song by David Hamilton. Uh, it says this, Time measured out my days, and life carried me along. In my soul I yearned to follow God, but knew I'd never be so strong. I looked hard at this world just to learn how heaven could be gained, just to end where I began, where human effort is all in vain. Were it not for grace, I can tell you where I'd be, wandering down some pointless road to nowhere with my salvation up to me. I know how that would go, the battles I would face, forever running but losing the race, were it not for grace. So here is all my praise expressed with all my heart, offered to the friend who took my place and ran a course I could not start. And knowing fully just how much his love would cost, he still went the final mile between me and heaven so I would not be lost, were it not for grace. Beautiful words tribute to God's infinite love and uh, favor that we do not deserve. The Apostle John speaks of God's grace as well in John chapter 1 and uh, also Paul again in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, but God, Paul credits the grace of God for 
his ministry, his missions, foreign missions ministry, and foreign cultures. He speaks of the Gentiles uh, 10 times in this passage here in Romans 15. And uh, speaks of the gospel four times here. And so he's, he's just reflecting about the, the incredible grace of God. In Romans 15, 15, he says it this way, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being set apart, sanctified by the Holy Ghost. And so he talks about how he works harder than any other gospel minister, serving the Lord in his outreach to the Gentiles. And it's trying to reach Gentiles so that they would be obedient to the gospel, to the word of God. Uh, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, he says. Yeah, I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, Romans 15, 20 says. And so he goes through and speaks of his ministry uh, of the gospel on a worldwide scale. And uh, he, he attributes his compassion, his personal compassion for others to the grace of God working in his life. And he demonstrated that, that compassion through generosity with his time and with his money. Remember, Paul was a tent maker missionary. He went out and paid his own way, so to speak. Uh, so his, his personal compassion and, and uh, his, his, his commitment was uh, all by the grace of God working in his, his heart. Because he was a, a persecutor of the church. And, and now he, he went out with pioneering courage uh, to unknown places and great peril. Uh, went to different cultures and races. Uh, he showed his, his courage by going to unevangelized areas and uh, to dangerous areas. And, uh, and then finally, he realizes how much prayer commitments, uh, how, much, how important prayer commitment is to, to his worldwide global ministry. And so he pleads with the believers to unite together with him in prayer. Uh, he, he calls them to pray for him, First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, Ephesians 6. And he, he explains that uh, prayer for missionaries demonstrates how one loves the Lord Jesus Christ and how one loves the Holy Spirit. Uh, so look with me in, in chapter, again, Romans 15, verse uh, 29 and following. I'm sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, for the love of Christ, for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Pray for me that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, and that you may be refreshed. refreshed. And so Paul begs for prayer. Pray for me that I have boldness. Pray for me that I will uh, be protected, uh, that I will have open doors, I have opportunity. Uh, so that, you know, Paul was in very real danger. He was being rejected both from the saved and the unsaved at, at times in his ministry. And uh, we too, we face opposition. We face uh, even sometimes uh, resistance from fellow missionaries. And there's always uh, you know, testing that we face uh, on, on a foreign field, probably unique to what you face in ministry here, but uh, very similar things as well. Uh, so uh, Christ enabled Paul to be in ministry. His enabling grace was sufficient. Paul talks a lot about how God's grace is sufficient, 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, even it's exceeding abundant. It's, it's more than enough, uh, God's grace. And so we, we rejoice in God's uh, amazing grace in ministry. Uh, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus who has enabled me, putting me into the ministry. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant to me, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, injurious, uh, the chief of sinners, Paul called himself. And so, uh, Someone has said, if, if God didn't love and use sinners, he would have no one to love or to use. Mm. And that, that was Paul's testimony. I'm the chief of sinners. How could God use me? The answer is grace. Uh, and Paul concludes this letter to the Romans and other, others of his letters with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And amen. Uh, Paul was all about God's grace. Uh, he had a, a true compassion and love for others. He, uh, for him to live was Christ. And I was going to recall his famous uh, words there in Philippians. And I, just recently, I, we were watching a, a video about the 
airline pilot uh, named Sully. Have you seen the video named Sully? Have you ever heard of that? The, the, the pilot who landed the jet on the Hudson River in New York? We just watched that recently. And, and uh, one thing that stuck out to me in that video was how uh, the pilot's main concern throughout the whole ordeal was the rescue and survival of the 155 people on that jet. And his greatest concern, his greatest relief is when they told him that all 155 passengers survived. And so, you know, it's one thing to, you know, have a, a commitment as a pilot to the survival of the people under your care. It's another thing to have a commitment and compassion for the souls, lost souls of men. What we need to realize as, as believers, all of us, is that people are born dead in their trespasses and sin. And we need to have that same sense of commitment as Sully, the airline pilot, to the rescuing of dead spiritually people all around us. They are in danger of not surviving for eternity and having to go to eternal punishment if they are not rescued. And that is what God has called us to, to reach out to the parachute, rescue the parachute, care for the dying as we sang this morning. And uh, God's grace enables us to do that. I asked you this morning, are you depending on his grace? Are you grateful for his grace? If you are, you can have grace for gospel ministry locally or globally. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this brief opportunity to share worldwide missions. And so we ask you to give us a pioneering courage personal compassion, prayer commitment, and just to serve you humbly in gratitude for your grace. And we ask for you, by your grace this morning, to work in hearts. Perhaps someone here is yet without Christ. You would save them right here, right now. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I would ask you this morning, friend, if you are here uh, and you're not convinced, you're not persuaded that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. Just stop right here, right now, and realize you need Jesus. To, he's the only one that, by his grace, can save you and give you eternal life and, and give you access to that abundant life and abundant grace that's available. And so right here, right now, you can just pray and receive Christ as your Savior. Just admit you're a sinner to God and tell him in prayer, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. Please forgive me and grant me your eternal salvation. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you raised from the dead. I place my faith in you, Lord Jesus Christ. Save me. Give me the gift of eternal life. You can pray a prayer like that right here, right now. That's the most important decision you can make. If you're a believer here this morning and you're uh, distracted from your mission as a witness for Christ, just ask God to forgive you your complacency, your apathy. Maybe there's a sin in your life you haven't confessed. If there's something between you and the Lord, God in his grace will forgive. He's faithful and just to forgive as we confess our sin cleanse us from all unrighteousness so reflect on what you've heard this morning I ask you this morning and let's close in prayer and pastor come actually pastor come now and close the service as you would see fit and uh, we will continue on as we said this morning after the first service uh, we're living in a time uh, where it is very easy to be able to get in a conversation about eternity. Um, there's never been a time that I'm aware of besides probably Y2K <laughs> when that happened that you could actually just start a conversation with anybody anywhere about if you died right now, where would you spend eternity? And that question to someone out in the public today is not, um, I want to say, alarming. Or how dare you ask me that question? That wouldn't phase a person today if you ask that because of what is going on. Do you really love to tell the story to everybody you come involved with? Whether it be family, whether it be friends, neighbors, whatever it is, do you really love to tell the story? Let's sing, I love to tell the story.